name is Amber Mathwig out of Minnesota with Local 638, and I am working preload at UPS. Hey everyone, my name is Tony. I'm a UPS Teamster out of Local 174 in Seattle, Washington. I'm a member of Teamsters Mobilize, a reform organization in the Teamsters. Hi everyone, my name is Chantal. I'm a UPS part-timer in Local 177, uh, North Jersey, and I'm very glad to be here. Hi, I'm Rick Smith, host of The Rick Smith Show and a 35-year Teamster in the freight industry. Hey, all, I'm Zoe. I'm a UPS Teamster out of Local 391 in North Carolina. Uh, Third-generation Teamster, also prez of North Carolina Pride at Work. Hey, guys, my name is Jess. I am a preload steward at UPS out of Local 728 in Atlanta, and I am a member of the LGBTQ Caucus, a member of Teamsters Mobilize, and a recently banned member of TDU, but still hoping to bring good change. Nice to be here. Hey y'all, Kat uh, out of Oakland, Teamsters Local 70, where I work as a part-timer at UPS, also as a shop steward. Robert Conklin, Teamsters Local 665, San Francisco, North Bay. Um, third generation Teamster, became a member in 2000. My claim to fame is we've been hired and fired from every barn in the local. Um, casual UPS driver during the holidays, and right currently I'm in sales at a Teamster organized frozen food company. All right. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Working People, a podcast about the lives, jobs, dreams, and struggles of the working class today, brought to you in partnership with In These Times Magazine and The Real News Network, produced by Jules Taylor and made possible by the support of listeners like you. Working People is a proud member of the Labor Radio Podcast Network. If you're hungry for more worker and labor-focused shows like ours, follow the link in the show notes and go check out the other great shows in our network. And please support the work that we're doing here at Working People because we can't keep going without you. Share our episodes with your co-workers, your friends, and family members. Leave positive reviews of the show on Spotify and Apple Podcasts, and reach out to us if you have recommendations for working folks you'd like us to talk to. And please support the work that we do at The Real News Network by going to therealnews.com forward slash donate, especially if you want to see more reporting from the front lines of struggle around the U.S. and across the world. My name is Maximilian Alvarez. And I'm Mel Buer. And we've got a doozy of an episode for y'all today. As you guys can guess from this incredible panel of Teamsters Union members that we have assembled here, we put out the bat signal and, you know, the bat, the Batman and women and siblings came a coming. We are diving right into the story that has set the labor world on fire this week. And make no mistake, this is not just a labor story. What we're talking about today will impact all of us. On Monday, July 15th, on day one of the Republican National Convention, Sean O'Brien, president of the International Brotherhood of Teamsters, became the first Teamsters president ever to address the RNC. Invited by former President Trump, who is now officially the Republican nominee for the 2024 presidential election, O'Brien's speech was no ordinary RNC filler. And to anyone watching or anyone paying attention to the political reality in this country, this was no ordinary RNC either. O'Brien's very presence on the RNC stage and the contents of his speech, which lasted for about 17 minutes, have sparked a firestorm of intense reactions and furious debates within the labor movement and the Republican and Democratic parties alike. We've linked to the full speech in the show notes of this episode, and we encourage listeners to watch it in its entirety. But we're going to play about three minutes worth of clips here at the top of the episode to give you a clear sense of what we're going to be talking about today and why it's important. Take a listen. Today, today the Chiefs is out here to say we are not beholden to anyone or any party. We will create an agenda and work with a bipartisan coalition ready to accomplish something real for the American worker. Yeah. 
And I don't care about getting criticized. It's an honor to be the first Teamster in our 121-year history to address the Republican National Convention. <laughs> to be frank, when President Trump invited me to speak at this convention, there was political unrest on the left and on the right. Hard to believe. Anti-union groups demanded the President rescind his invitation. The left called me a traitor. And this is precisely why it's so important for me to be here today. Think about this. Think about this. The Teamsters are doing something correct. If the extremes in both parties think I shouldn't be on this stage. Now, you can have whatever opinion you want, but one thing is clear. President Trump is a candidate who is not afraid of hearing from new, loud, and often critical voices. And I think we all can agree whether people like him or they don't like him, in light of what happened to him on Saturday, he has proven to be one tough SOB. Yeah. You know, corporatists hate when working people join together to form unions. But for a century, major employers have waged a war against labor by forming corporate unions of their own. We need to call the Chamber of Commerce and the business roundtables what they are. They are unions for big business. And here's another fact. Against gigantic multinational corporation, an individual worker has zero power. It's only when Americans band together in democratic unions that we win real improvements on wages, benefits, and working conditions. Companies like Amazon are bigger than most national economies. Amazon is valued over $2 trillion. That makes it the 14th largest economy in the world. What is sickening is that Amazon has abandoned any national allegiance. Amazon's sole focus is on lining its own pockets. Remember, elites have no party, elites have no nation. Their loyalty is to the balance sheet and the stock price at the expense of the American worker. We need trade policies that put American workers first. It needs to be easier for companies to remain in America. We need legal protections that make it safer for workers to get a contract. We must stop corporations from abandoning local communities to inflate their bottom line. Labor law must be reformed. Americans vote for a union but can never get a union contract. Companies fire workers who try to join unions and hide behind toothless laws that are meant to protect working people but are manipulated to benefit corporations. This is economic terrorism at its best. An individual cannot withstand such an assault. A fired worker cannot afford corporate delays, and these greedy employers know it. There are no consequences for the company, only the worker. Reactions to the speech have been polarized, to say the least. While certain lines from O'Brien's speech garnered cheers and applause from the conservative, traditionally anti-union crowd at the RNC, many lines from that speech emphatically did not. And while many Republican voting and conservative-leaning union members have expressed excitement about O'Brien's speech, O'Brien has faced an avalanche of criticism from within his own union and across the labor movement. Even one member of the Teamsters digital team went rogue and posted an 
now deleted tweet from the Teamsters main social account on X, criticizing O'Brien's fawning praise for Republican Senator Josh Hawley. Quote, unions gain nothing from endorsing the racist, misogynistic and anti-trans politics of the far right, the Post said. No matter how much people like Senator Hawley attempt to tether such bigotry to a cynical pro-labor message, end quote. Everyone is talking about this speech and what it all means for workers, but workers themselves need to be driving that conversation. And that's exactly what we're going to do here today. We're putting working people in the driver's seat where they belong. And we are so grateful to have so many hardworking folks here with a range of critical perspectives that need to be heard. And as we toss things to our incredible panel of Teamsters, a quick note on the ground rules here. Because we want to make the best use of this time that we all have together. So Mel and I will primarily be here to ask questions and moderate so that we're, you know, making sure that everyone gets a chance to say their piece and everyone gets equal time to speak because we got a lot of great folks here. And, you know, we've designated a batting order of speakers and we're going to go in that order with each round of questions. So it's not going to be a full back and forth uh, sort of discussion given all the voices that we have have on today we want to you know make prioritize giving everyone a chance to say their piece and we'll try to go around the table as many times as we can in the time that we've got lastly i know we've all got lots and lots of thoughts and feelings about this speech and we absolutely want this to be a lively fair forward-moving discussion where everyone can speak freely and frankly. But we also want to model for our audience and our fellow workers and union members what respectful and productive conversation looks like. And we want to encourage folks out there to get involved in these kinds of discussions in their own union halls, in their living rooms, and so on. And so swearing is totally okay. In fact, it is encouraged here on Working People. But uh, no personal attacks, no slurs, no anything like that. None of that will be tolerated. And we encourage folks out there who are going to have these kinds of conversations to, yeah, just check in, set some ground rules, and then dig in with your uh, with your fellow workers, your family members, and your community members and talk about the things that are really important to you. And so with all that up top, I say let's get to it. Mel, do you want to uh, toss the first question our incredible panel? Yeah. Um, so if it's a good place to start just to get folks' general thoughts. What, what are the impressions of the speech itself? Did you watch it in its entirety? Did you see pieces of it online that you found to be particularly interesting and or odious? Um, what were the conversations that you've been having with other members about it? Uh, other fellow rank and file in your own local or online? Um, yeah, let's just get your general thoughts to start off the conversation. Yeah, this is Amber. Uh, I knew it was happening. I didn't know if I'd be awake for it for preload. We're starting at 4 a.m. right now. And so I'm, I, I'm usually asleep shortly around this time that we're talking tonight. Um, but I had fallen asleep really early and I woke up at like 9.05 and I thought I had missed it. I was like, oh, I'll find it online. And then I realized, no, they're probably behind. They're always going to be behind. And so I just kind of lay in there on the couch and I watched the whole thing. And I think like if my brother was up here, he would say that I was screaming at the television so loud in real time. It was like, this is so surreal. I, I, I'm just hearing this like crazy spew out of his mouth. Just unquestionably giving love to Donald Trump and JD Vance and Jock Hawley. And like my primary thought was there is no historical support for cozying up to fascism. You know, you think you're going to get somewhere with this. You think you're going to get workers somewhere. You are going to end up leaving behind so many people that it's, that it's in favor of a, you know, white nationalist state that that's who they're seeking, you know, profits or labor for like it, and it, I was also kind of thinking through um, how much or how little applause he got for the most part. There was just not a lot of enthusiasm when he was attacking corporations um, and a couple of other spots. But largely, 
it, it just felt like everyone was embarrassed and everyone was disappointed. And then to wake up the next morning and see him, you know, 100%, everything Josh Hawley says. And then almost the very first thing is we need to get away from the queers and the people of color in the workplace. It's like, oh, 100%, 100%. Like, and I think that there's historical support for that. That uh, there, he did use racial slurs on the campaign or on the contract trail last year. Um, there was the recent lawsuit settled for racism. It's unsurprising, and also it is very surprising at the same time how he looked like a like a like a schoolboy who just got away with you know stealing a chocolate or something, just so giddy and excited about being there and then just being so dismissive of the 1.2 million teamsters that he is, you know, supposed to be accountable to. Um, and that's where I'm going to wrap up right now. And just to a clarifying point for uh, folks listening, um, what uh, Amber was referring to there uh, the day after the RNC was an article that Senator Josh Hawley wrote for Compact Magazine entitled The Promise of pro Labor Conservatism, uh, which then uh, Sean O'Brien tweeted uh, from his ex account, his personal ex account, saying Josh Hawley is 100 percent right. Uh, and we will link to that tweet in the show notes as well. Well, what I find so amazing is Sean O'Brien's ability to talk out of both sides of his mouth. In this speech, he, he talked about taking on big corporations. Um, he, t- he said that uh, the Teamsters Union will not be beholden to this or that political party. But talk is cheap. And workers need action. So. What did what have we seen from Sean O'Brien in reality? Very different from his rhetoric. He he says that the Teamsters Union is not going to be beholden to this or that political party, but he worked hand in glove with the Biden administration to crush the rail struggle. He worked hand in glove with the Biden administration in backroom deals with Carol Tomei, UPS CEO. Uh, to put together a last-minute sellout tentative agreement in 2023 to avert a strike. So I don't buy this rhetoric from O'Brien. Yeah, this is Chantal. I'll just say a little bit more about who I am. Um, But, uh, yeah, I'm a UPS part-timer. I'm on uh, day sort in northern New Jersey. Um, And I'm a member of Teamsters Mobilize. I'm here with a number of uh, my fellow TM members uh, who, you know, we all organized in the uh, Vote No, like 2023 UPS um, contract campaign. Um, And I'm also a member of uh, Maoist Communist Union. Um, My thoughts uh, watching it was... I guess, like, overall, not too surprised based on everything that we've seen from O'Brien uh, from the very beginning of his presidency, um, like for years, uh, when, you know, I think it was early last year in some Senate hearing, he was talking about how unions are really good for business, how he has great working relationships with the CEOs of all these various companies. Uh, and when companies do well, the unions do well, the workers do well. So, uh, I mean, I think, up until relatively recently in this election season, most, most or a lot of that was kind of directed towards like the Biden administration. Um, and like kind of Tony mentioned the different, like the collaboration that they had on the rail, uh, rail contract and the UPS contract, um, to sell out the workers. But, um, yeah, like the main, there's a lot of, you know, disturbing things that he said in his speech where He's really trying to put forward that uh, actually workers and our bosses and the capitalists do have shared interests. Um, And he said it in a few different ways, um, which maybe we can um, talk about later. But with regards to like bringing, you know, back jobs to the U.S. uh, and stuff like that, um, really whipping up like a lot of obviously like nationalist kind of U.S. patriotism, kind of chauvinism, which is quite dangerous. 
But uh, yeah, I think like for me in terms of, you know, what we've seen from him in terms of like all of his rhetoric is like all bluster about caring about the workers. And he said like, oh, I, I go around every week and I talk to my members. It's like, we actually know what you're like to talk to because uh, so many of us have met him like during the UPS uh, contract negotiations. He totally, he came to my building, uh, completely avoided, like deflected my question of like, will we strike if there's a TA that the workers haven't agreed on? Because up to that point, that's what he'd been saying. And then he was like, oh, well, no one really wants to strike. Strikes are hard. Um, and then at Labor Notes, uh, he spoke on a panel and I asked him a few questions afterwards about the UPS contract, about why there was a new tier for part-time workers, about the fact that there was close, close collaboration with the Biden administration to avert a strike, all these things. And he completely brushed me off. He was like almost running away saying he had to catch a plane. So yeah, I think, you know, uh, a lot of us who are like pretty involved in, I think like the Teamsters um, organizing and, you know, uh, have met, have met Sean O'Brien at, at various kind of conferences and conventions or at our barns. Uh, this is pretty much like a continuation of um, like his whole tenure as the Teamsters president up to this point. Hi, I'm Rick Smith, host of the Rick Smith Show. And if you want to find out everything I've said about Sean O'Brien, you can check out our podcast because uh, I have spoken extensively about this since January, since the Magalago trip and the, the whole thumbs up thing. Uh, my problem is, is this isn't about Sean O'Brien. This is about the fact that I lived through four years of Donald Trump's uh, tenure. I lived through a labor department that was hostile to workers. I lived through a department, of, uh, a labor secretary who, well, the one they wanted was a fast food restaurant CEO who wanted to eliminate workers. The other one, well, just uh, just a corporate Walmart lawyer. Um, and the NLRB, you know, under him was horrible. Uh, his general counsel was the guy who was instrumental in firing the PATCO workers. So I, the backdrop of this speech is me remembering what Donald Trump was like in the White House, how bad things were for workers, how many bad decisions came out of his NLRB, the Supreme Court justices that he put on the court uh, that have decimated workers' rights and, and are going to make it worse. We're going to head back to the days of the Lochner era, where if you're hungry enough and desperate enough, to work for poverty wages. It's going to be your freedom. Uh, this is the path that we're on. It's the path that Donald Trump set us on. So understanding that as the backdrop, I look at Sean O'Brien as basically Donald Trump's uh, dancing show pony, uh, who Donald Trump is going to ride right to the election, because what O'Brien accomplished was to legitimize the Trump record and to softly attack Joe Biden's strong point. Uh, the fact that Joe Biden is the most pro-labor president of my lifetime, at least, and some say since FDR. So by doing that, you have given a tacit endorsement of maybe not the Teamsters, but Sean O'Brien to someone who I think I think one of the guys I work with said it best. How is it our general president can call a rapist a tough SOB? And, and I got to be honest, I was shocked to hear that from our members, because I work in a place where this is Trump country. Uh, and central Pennsylvania is very much Trump country, and our local is very much uh, Trump Trump country. So to hear that was kind of surprising. Now, uh, the reality is, is he went to that convention for a reason, and that was to get attention. He got to say words in about two-thirds of the speech. I'll be honest with you. I don't have a problem with it. I'm in favor of attacking the Chamber of Commerce and the Business Roundtable and all of the people who have decimated wages, hours, and conditions, especially in my lifetime. Uh, the problem is, is these conventions, they're big pep rallies to do one thing, and that's to coronate their, their dear leader and then get them elected. So he walked into that environment knowing that the whole purpose of that, that, that convention was to get Donald Trump and J.D. Vance elected. Now, some would say maybe someone sold him on the idea that he's going to be the George Meany of this generation. He's going to be able to whisper in Trump's ear. Uh, the sad reality is we've seen what Donald Trump does to the very best people. And I've been asking the question of when Sean O'Brien is thrown under the proverbial truck, uh, what's his nickname going to be? This speech did nothing to help organize labor. It actually did 
I think, harm by showing that there's division in the House of Labor. I think he's he's opened up the secret that the Teamsters are split uh, and that there are working people who do support Donald Trump. So instead of him going out and educating members, being a true leader and saying, hey, members, this guy was bad for us. Here's all the ways he was bad for us. He chose to pander to the person who made our lives worse and is promising, well, to eliminate us altogether. The sad reality is, is uh, he allowed himself to be used, and history will remember uh, that. Now, nobody's going to remember what he said in a month, but they are going to remember that he was there. And whether the Teamsters endorse or not, and I said a year ago the Teamsters were going to endorse no one, which would be an endorsement for Trump, Sean O'Brien's already endorsed Trump with that glowing review of him being a tough SOB and being courageous to have him in there. No, he wasn't courageous. He knows how to use people. And President O'Brien got used. I feel like my my knee-jerk reaction to watching um, Sean O'Brien's speech was, man, this guy doesn't want to be our general president no more. He wants to get a job in whatever administration wins this election. And, and you know, I, I would agree. I, I think most of us would agree that we need to, as workers, we really need to be advocating for our issues. We're the only ones that are going to do it. You know, rich people aren't going to come in and look out for the workers. So we got to do it ourselves. And that's why we have unions. And that's why we need to have independent politics as unions. And so when Sean O'Brien says something like, you know, the Teamsters aren't beholden to any one party, I, you know, I agree with that. But what you're doing is you're beholden by going to, to both the RNC and the DNC. You know, you're beholden to all these sets of politicians. I, I think part of why you know, Republicans are able to like do this and, and get Sean O'Brien as, as you said, it, Rick, as their show pony is because Democrats have just not been bold enough and have not been able to deliver on a number of issues. And Republicans like Trump, like Josh Hawley are able to grab at that low hanging fruit. And ultimately, you know, it's not going to be uh, Sean O'Brien that suffers. It's going to be the members of our union that suffer. If a Trump administration comes in, we are going to have to face a lot of questions about what parts of Project 2025 are going to be implemented. You know, they want to get rid of unions. They want to get rid of the NLRB. They want to get rid of OSHA. And, and you know, Trump's Supreme Court picks have already begun to chip away at that. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, I agree with a lot of what Rick was saying. Sean O'Brien is definitely being used. He's being used to sway the vote of the Teamsters. Um, 1.3 million people is a lot of people. Um, either way you look at it, this election is going to be very close. And trying to win the vote of the Teamsters could make the difference of who's the president. And Sean O'Brien knows that. Like Rick said, this, this is a pep rally. This is a big hoorah to get these votes. Sean O'Brien ran and campaigned on being a true reformer, on bringing transparency and democracy to our union. He is still creating that illusion by all the messages that he's sending to the Teamsters. And there are many Teamsters that have not yet seen through that. They're looking and hearing his words and not his actions of what he's actually done. So he is, by being there and by speaking and by throwing out these names, praising these different Republicans, um, putting down the left, um, purposely leaving these pauses for the audience to boo at the left, um, he was clear. He said he did not care about the criticism that he was going to receive. He said that it was his honor to be the first IBT president to speak at the RNC. Um, that's harmful. That is harmful to workers. It is harmful to unions. It is harmful for the future of unions, which is already in a decline. Um, he made the statement that the last 40 years, um, Republicans had really been fighting for pro-labor. That is a complete lie. Republicans have been fighting to destroy unions. Look at all the right-to-work states. Look at how those laws were put into place. 
They were put into place by Republicans. Um, you know, this is, like Rick said, some of what he said, you know, about big business and, um, you know, taking advantage of workers, all that is true. But Sean O'Brien is working with those companies and enabling them to do that. He's trying to convince members that contracts are good when contracts aren't good. That is for the benefit of the company. That is not for the benefit of the members. There are still people a year later after our UPS contract that are still saying good things about the contract. Don't get me wrong. This last year, more and more people's eyes have become open. But there's still a lot of people that aren't as involved, that don't have their ear to the ground, that aren't looking into things, that still believe this rhetoric that Sean O'Brien and the TDU are putting out in regards to the UPS contract, all these other contracts that have been settled, and what Sean O'Brien is doing for labor. Um, he's not doing good things for labor. It's all an illusion. It's all smoke and mirrors. Um, he has his own personal interest in mind. Whatever his outcome, whatever his hopes are for going and speaking at the RNC, it's to benefit Sean O'Brien. It is not to benefit the workers. So um, listening to everybody's uh, viewpoint so far, I, I'm going to be the be the devil's advocate on this one because uh, um, I saw things a little differently. Now, when I first heard Sean O'Brien was going to go to the Republican National Convention, I went, what the fuck? Um, how is that? How is that working out? And, you know, the more that I thought about it, I go, you know, and it might be a difference in opinion in this room, but I said, Sean's not a stupid dude. He's doing this for a reason. Um, now, we had a straw poll, I don't know, a couple months ago or about a month ago, who you wanted for president. And I'm pretty sure Sean got those numbers. And I, you know, shockingly was probably a lot closer um, than I would like to believe. Um and he had to make a decision because the thing is, is um, I do have a lot of uh, conserv fellow Teamsters that are very, very conservative who, you know, go, oh, they're just going to go with the Democrats or this and that. And our voice isn't heard. And, and you know, I've heard it. Uh, they bring the pipeline up and they bring um, the rail strike up. And it's kind of like, you know, I hear everybody talking about it, but they, you know, you know, on the surface, yeah, it looks pretty bad. but. Um, there is, uh, there's more to this story because we weren't in the room and I'm pretty sure none of us were in the room of how that handled because it was, uh, you know, I don't want to sit here and, uh, defend Sean's honor. He can do it himself. And, you know, uh, the way I look at it is I was I'm watching this speech, my jaw's hitting the floor and I go, what in the fuck are you doing? Sitting there tickling balls or whatever you want to want to call it. And then he called him a tough Trump a tough SOB. And I kind of just go, what the fuck? And then all of a sudden, you kind of see his demeanor change, and he pivots to a fiery pro-worker, pro-labor speech, which was, if you actually listen to it, was very, very good. And I think every working person in America should hear. Um, I get everybody's viewpoint of he shouldn't have been there. And, you know, was him not being invited to the DNC? Was that a ruse? Because the way I look at it, he kind of Trojan horsed in there and dropped a labor speech on primetime TV in front of millions of viewers, which I think is, you know, they did. He he didn't have to knock the door down. They 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 invited him with open arms, and I I understand the, the optics of it. Absolutely, it, it's a bad look. I I can't disagree with that. But what he accomplished, he did say. He, nobody's ever been invited, you know, no labor leaders ever been invited to the Republican convention. This is true. Um, and he got invited. And now I get everybody's is, hang up with that. Um, he did call out some Republican senator. But you got to think about it. If you're scraping the barrel and all you can come up with is with Josh Hawley at his, you know, AFL-CIO score of 11 percent. I mean, he had to find something to praise somebody about. Um, because if they knew he was going to go in and drop that speech, 
I don't think they would have let him in the door. So the the way I look at it is, you know, when he was there, you know, he had to play the game. But when, you know, for the last two thirds of the speech, he he dropped some shit. You know, he he dropped some stuff people needed to hear. And you know, if the Democratic Party was smart, they would have him go in, do that speech, and say, "Kick it up a few notches," because that's what the American people need to hear. Will that happen? I don't know. But I, I, you know, the first time I watched it, I was a little kind of, you know, every I've watched it a couple times, and more and more I look at it, and when you start listening to what he's saying, I'm like, "God damn, how did he get away with that?" Because if I was a fly on the wall in that convention, people were elbowing each other going, who'd let this motherfucker in the room? And are we being punked? Because nowhere would you ever expect to see that. So it, it was, it was a surprise. I get it. You know, you know, we shouldn't fraternize with those Republicans. I, I, I get it. But the thing is, is he saw an opportunity that's probably never going to happen again. Cause they ain't going to let any labor, labor, labor through those doors ever again. So he went in there, dropped the bomb. It is what it is. My opinion is 99.9% of America has already decided who they're voting on for president. Yes, it can sway either way, but it's going to be too close for comfort. And he had to make a calculated decision. So I, I support what he did. You know, it's it, that's about best I can I can explain it because the speech he made, if you actually listen to it and get past the hatred for you know the Republicans or Donald Trump. Um, that speech was pretty fire, as the young kids say. So anyways, I'm going to leave it at that. And I will go into my union negotiations and hopefully we'll be back. And you guys can all talk shit about me behind my back. So I'll talk to you later. Yeah, um, before I start, I'll just give a little bit of an introduction as to who I am and where I'm coming from. Um, as I mentioned, shop steward at UPS in Oakland under Local 70. Um, also a proud member of Teamsters Mobilize, a small group of rank and file workers who are trying to organize and take action to advocate for pro-worker um, organization and, and policies within our union. Um, and I am additionally a member of Maoist Communist Union USA. Um, I... I watched the whole video of Sean O'Brien's speech. And as I watched, I had in my mind the conversations that I frequently take part in with coworkers on my shop floor who are all UPS part-timers, um, all part of this lower tier of workers within the UPS workforce who are paid far less, receive far less in wages and benefits than the rest of um, the UPS drivers um, and are generally treated as sort of second-class citizens within the UPS uh, worker world. Um, and the vast majority of people, when I talk to them about the upcoming presidential elections, they tell me, I don't think either of those men is going to serve my interests. I don't think much will change depending on who's president, whether it's Donald Trump or Joe Biden. And uh, I think that that's reflective of an objective truth that for the majority of working people in this country, their overall quality of life is not so much dependent on which party is in power, but in the chaotic boom and bust economic cycle of the capitalist system in the inevitable cycle of war and relative peace that breaks out as different sections of the ruling class across the world duke it out for control over various territories and natural resources. Um, and so when I watched Sean O'Brien's speech, I was not really watching it um, from a particular standpoint of thinking, oh, um, he's crossed over to the dark side. I think the Republicans and the Democrats when you look at the grand scheme of history, have not done much uh, actually at all to serve the interests of the working class people in this country. Um, and I think uh, there's an interesting contrast between Rob's view that Sean O'Brien kind of busted a Trojan horse into this convention versus Rick's view that he was used as a pawn. 
Um, and I'm excited to debate those two views together in this podcast. I don't really agree with either of them. I think that Sean O'Brien made a calculated strategic move um, in seeing that the Republican Party is making some shifts towards trying to court the unions in this country um, based on broader developments that are happening in the economy uh, internationally as well as within the United States. Uh, and I think that there's some specific parts of the speech that point towards that. So in the future questions, we can talk more about it. Let's let's dig into that, right? Because um, you know this this has been really great so far, and and I just appreciate everyone sharing their their thoughts um, and and perspectives, and I hope that yeah, folks listening, this is as um, you know incredible for you as it is for us, and I really hope you're taking ev what everyone is saying to heart, right? Because as we know, if you listen to the show, the one thing that I hope you take away from it is that the working class is not one thing. Uh, <laughs> you know, we are are the most diverse class, right? And, uh, you know, it's important that we have uh, fora like this where we can, you know, like talk amongst ourselves about what we as a class uh, need to do and how we proceed uh, in a way that benefits all of us. And that's what we're trying to model here. And I and I think what I'm hearing from from all of you, right, is that, um, yeah, I mean, like, there, there was calculation that went into this. I mean, I, I, I'm I, trying to think in as a former conservative who, you know, grew up in a non-union family, thinking many things about unions. Uh, this was this was not so long ago, um, you know, but like I can imagine to to someone like me, to someone like, you know, the folks in my family who feel that way, seeing, you know, Sean O'Brien on that stage, uh, just like seeing Chris Smalls on Tucker Carlson tonight, right? It would put someone in front of me that I, that did not exist, you know, like in my orbit until then. Um, and maybe even leave me with a more favorable impression of them and the union itself. Like, I, I mean, <laughs> I've been on Megyn Kelly's show and got her to say, she supported the Amazon labor union at the time, right? And as a former conservative, that excited me. But then as I think y'all are really forcing us to ask is like, but what is that going to really mean beyond the rhetoric? What is it going to mean, you know, beyond just the sort of surface level understanding of a, a political s discussion where we got to kind of address the fact that yeah, union members vote Republican, union members vote Democrat, union members don't vote at all, right? So you got to kind of work within that realm. But we're, it, from the conversation in the first round, what I'm gleaning is that, you know, we're really talking about beyond the rhetoric, what is this going to mean for us on the shop floor? What is this going to mean for the economy and the 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 plight of working people writ large? Um, and, and what exactly, you know, like, does this portend, you know, like, if indeed, um, you know, Donald Trump becomes the next president? Um, and uh, this, you know, what, what Sean O'Brien was expressing hope for in that speech on Monday is really put to the test. Um, we're going to all find out what that means uh, in our daily lives. And that's where I want to um, kind of hit on with this second question, right? I want to bring this down to eye level, to the shop floor level and ask, you know, like, what implications does this have um, for you all as union members and workers in your day to day lives, the folks that you work with and care about? Um, and um, yeah, I mean, like, what do what is this like, kind of uh, approach that that, that O'Brien is taking, which we should mention is it is not representative of the labor movement writ large. Um, Mel and I were just listening to Sean Fain of the UAW speak last week at Netroots here in Baltimore. His speech was markedly different from Sean O'Brien's speech to the RNC. And we'll, we'll try to link to that as well so you guys can compare. But um, yeah, let's go back at the uh, around the table again. And talk about like what the implications here are for you all and your fellow workers on the shop floor level at the basic level of living your lives and, and, and achieving a comfortable life with dignity. Where do you think that this approach that O'Brien is trying to take, what, not endorsing either party, trying to kind of thread a bipartisan uh, in, in more independent labor needle here, what do you think that means for our movement? Amber, let's toss it back to you. Big loaded questions tonight. Right, Max, very important. 
uh, for the folks at home, we did not get them pre-written. So really going off the cuff here. Yeah, that's a really great setup to continue this conversation there, Max, because you just have my brain all over the place thinking about, I have all these like big picture, you know, I what's going to happen as you're talking. And the first thing I'm thinking about is, again, going, ba- going back to what I said earlier, I believe, is that the, 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 the labor movement that Josh Hawley wants, that J.D. Vance wants, that Donald Trump just wants to control the profits of, right? Um, they want that movement for white Christian men. Uh, and so to, again, see uh, Sean O'Brien kind of cozying up to that with this nationalist idea in place, like we can all care. Yeah, you can carry that out together. And it's a really good plan if it was for everybody. But when you contrast it against Project 2025, what we know from Trump's last administration, that he has not calmed down his rhetoric, that he can probably do whatever he wants now, um, and people are just going to support it unequivocally. And we already know that we're losing Democratic progressive seats coming this fall. And so to even think about what's going to happen to some of the most disaffected workers, um, our immigrant, you know, brothers and sisters and comrades, uh, in those areas, it's going to completely shift how our entire labor labor movement is going. Um, it's going to bring back, I don't think they're going to bring back labor. Like, why would they do that? It's going to mix with all these other plans that they have. Um, but what, let, let me bring it back down to my level. Um, one of the great benefits that I have just really enjoyed having for the last two years as a union member um, is that they can't fire me for my personality. Uh, I'm very outspoken. Um, and when I know that I can advocate for myself at work because I'm protected from being fired for doing that, and then to think that, like, oh, the head of the Teamsters Union basically doesn't think that I should be here at all, you know, through inclusion, diversity, equity, uh, making sure that LGBTQ are safe. And then I immediately shift to our joint council, joint council 32, shout out hosted a pride booth, not just a booth. It was a double booth. So for two days, it was two weeks ago. Um, and we're one of the few unions to actually have a booth set up. And I just heard so many positive responses from people of all ages, uh, you know, just to see us there. I did have some people asking if team says are going to endorse Trump and into my head, I'm like, I don't know because we just did this stupid straw poll that apparently has no precedent. So like, I think he really is trying to get support to endorse Trump. And so in like thinking about we're putting all this effort into making sure that, you know, queer people and people who support our community know that they are also welcome in the union to like read the history and to know how many, I'm sorry, now my dog is dying next to me. <laughs> I just realized how loud she was. You can leave that in, Jules. Just don't make me sound like a bad mother. Um, BB, <laughs> shut me up. I'll finish my rant later. To Rick's point, uh, I might use it in a different way. I think our union leaders have for too long been the show ponies of the Democratic Party who have tried to court the unions for votes and for uh, public support for a very long time while working actually against their interests, the interests of the workers in those unions. Uh, Something I think that needs to be highlighted here is that we need working class political independence. We need our unions to take the lead on uh, breaking from these alliances 
uh, with the Democrats and the Republicans, where our union leaders are used as pawns in, in games for election season and uh, uh, working people are left behind. What I heard from O'Brien's speech is that whether it's the Democratic Party or the Republican Party in power, that Sean O'Brien is ready to play ball with whoever. Um, so what does this mean for workers on the ground um, and on the shop floor, as you asked? I'm one of the UPS Teamster part-timers who uh, got included in this new part-timer tier of lower-paid part-time workers at UPS that had had Carol Tomei singing the praises of um, this contract and this negotiations for the shareholder. So I think we're going to see more of the same. I think we're going to see more backroom deals veiled behind the illusion of union reform. Uh, let's remember that Sean O'Brien ran on a reform ticket where he promised that we would have um, open bargaining and transparent bargaining. But during the 2023 UPS negotiations, um, uh, everything was behind closed doors. The whole bargaining committee was made to sign non-disclosure agreements in direct violation of the campaign promise. So I think we're going to see more sellout contracts as O'Brien struts around as a union fighter and a champion as a work of the working class. I think we're going to see him be a show pony for either party now. Yeah, I uh, I would agree with that. I think uh, I didn't mention this on the last question, which um, was about kind of like what have conversations been like on the shop floor. Um, and what Kat said about her coworkers is very similar to my coworkers, which is that I asked people, um, oh, so when the debate, <laughs> when there was the debate, um, which was kind of an incredible thing to watch for, for many reasons. Uh, also just because it was like, after that point, all these people in like the media and the Democratic Party who had been saying like, Biden's totally fine, there's nothing wrong. After that, we're forced to say, okay, there's something wrong. Um, but setting that as that debate aside, um, I asked my coworkers, did they watch it? No. Uh, I mean, like a few, but they're a very, very small minority. And um, yeah, likewise with uh, Sean O'Brien speaking at the RNC, people knew uh, you know, there was like an assassination attempt on Trump. But in general, people really, uh, they, they've they said what, what Kat said, her coworkers have said, which is just, it doesn't really matter. They don't care. They have all this talk. Um, both parties will choose certain issues where they say, oh, look, the Democrats don't care about you in X, Y, Z way, uh, but the Republican Party will be there for you, you know? Um, look how bad the economy has been under Biden, which is objectively true. And so actually that's the main reason why I have a few coworkers. Um, I was talking to a coworker the other day um, and she's uh, an immigrant from Central America. And she was like, I think Trump is probably the way to go because look how like horrible the situation is under Biden. So I also think as somewhat of a, like a sidebar, it's pretty important that people aren't, um, uh, not saying people here in this virtual room, but just broadly, like aren't painting all Trump voters with the same brush. Because I think there are so many people who have become totally disillusioned with the Democratic Party uh, and how how it's really betrayed the you know working class people, how it's uh, betrayed uh, black people, uh, you know, immigrants. Uh, and because we're so um it's so drilled into us that any kind of political party, any kind of political action has to be either the Democratic Party or the Republican Party. So when people have you know, just been betrayed by the Democratic Party, then they think, OK, maybe then the Republican Party. And then, you know, we'll see that again. And that's kind of like what we see, I feel, every election season. But to go back to my original point, um, I think, yeah, the vast majority of my coworkers feel like they're just struggling. Uh, that especially like just to say right now it's like you know over 90 degrees in the warehouse and it's it's hard work um we're you know in general getting fewer hours um people can see also like when we do talk about what's going on internationally how much 
uh, money and weapons the U.S. is sending to Ukraine, to Israel, to bomb Gaza, like all these things people feel, I think, uh, rightly very upset about and do see uh, kind of the overall unity of the Democratic and Republican parties uh, on these main uh, topics. So that's all to say, of course, there's going to be different things that if Trump wins, which I think based on uh, what's happening in the society, it seems quite likely that he'll win. Of course, there's going to be uh, attacks on the working class, which we'll have to oppose, which we'll have to fight against. Um, but that would happen under a Biden um, presidency as well, or if they end up going with another nominee. But I'll, I'll stop there. I would love to live in a perfect world where we all had the same ideas and we were all moving in the same direction. Uh, you know, I look at O'Brien and I think he's reading the tea leaves of the of the union. Uh, there we're a legacy union with a lot of people. Uh, I look at myself. I work in a place where there's a lot of old straight white guys who uh, they would be okay with a anti woke union because uh, all they care about is putting food on their table and a roof over their heads. They want to go to work and have the job that we had. Uh, back when I started, you know, I started back in the in the late 80s. Uh, this was the freight job was a gold standard job. Uh, now it's just it's reasonable. And they've seen that loss of power over the years. And this idea, I used to say it all the time, uh, a drowning man will grab an anchor if you throw it to him. And we're in that kind of situation. You know, the Democrats have been less bad. There's no question about it. Uh, you know, every every uh, every bit of bipartisanship uh, that Sean says he wants has gone against working people. You know, I, I, I talked about the Motor Carrier Act of 1980, which was true bipartisan bipartisanship. Thirteen members in the House voted against it. Uh, Seventy senators voted for it. A Democratic senator signed it into law because it was going to help consumers. It was supposed to help our fuel problems. It was supposed to help all of this stuff. But it fucked over the entire freight industry in this country. And what we ended up with is what was a solidly middle class job, in most cases, being a sweatshop on wheels. So I understand the anger and everyone has their issue. Uh, I keep saying the labor movement should be the place where we we reunite this country, where we come together and we fight for these ideas of uh, and, and attempt to go after and be a more perfect union. Uh, but for me, you know, the political system that we have is the one you have to play in. Would I love to have a different one? Sure. But that's going to take us. If you've got a broken government, if you've got broken uh, legislative branches, you've got broken society and broken people because we can't seem to agree on what we want. So, you know, I, I asked the question, how did how did Sean O'Brien go from marching in the street with Bernie Sanders to sucking up to a wannabe dictator? Uh, had we gone into the streets more and, and pulled people into this movement, and instead of having 6 percent uh, private sector union density, have the 22 percent union density that when I started, or the 35 percent union density that we had when my grandparents were around. Had we that, then you have political power. We're holding on to little bits and pieces of it, because most voters, and this is the sad reality, most voters— the union endorsement doesn't seem to matter. I remember when I first started, a business agent would walk into the into the lunchroom and he'd he'd throw out a leaflet and say, "This is who we're supporting," and everyone would pick one up because they knew that that union had their best interests in mind. You walk into my lunchroom right now and you say we're supporting Joe Biden or the Democrats, uh, you better know where the exit is because you're probably not going to get out of there. And this has been this has been decades in the making. Uh, but for me, I look at this second. You know, Joe Biden has done some really good things, especially for the Teamsters. Uh, the fact that he bailed out, uh, which was the number one legislative priority of the Teamsters, uh, was to assure up the multi-employer pension fund, pass, pass the Butch Lewis Act, and ensure that retirees are able to retire. Um, Biden did that. Trump didn't do it. Obama didn't do it. Uh, Biden did it. And the loyalty that and the thank you that he got was what we saw. Uh, O'Brien went and said what everyone here just said. Uh, both sides suck. The system sucks. Well, it's the only one we've got right now. I don't see anything of changing. So for me, uh, it's about encouraging our coworkers and encouraging our friends and neighbors uh, to, yeah, pick a side, but maybe pick better people to run. Maybe pick, maybe to run yourself. Um, this is what the Republicans have done. Uh, and you have to give them credit. I, I go back to guy named Ralph Reed, 
Uh, he was the head of the, what was the, the moral majority or whatever the hell their name was. Um, he was asked how they built their, 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 their ecosystem. And he pulled out the SWAC handbook, the Steelworkers Organizing Committee handbook, and said, this is how we did it. We, we talked to people. We got into the churches. We got into their, into their spaces, and we organized. Uh, this is what we should be doing. You got issues. We need to be organizing. And that's where I would have preferred Sean O'Brien to spend his, spend his time. Um, I mean, there's, in three minutes, I can't go through everything here, but um, at the end of the day, um, the Republicans have been, and the people in that convention hall have been, uh, the ones who have done an awful lot of damage. Democrats haven't been a lot of help, but the Republicans are the ones holding the noose around our neck. Uh, so that's where I'm going to leave it. Yeah, um, I think just coming back to what it how it is on the shop floor is I, I just had a conversation this morning about um, the election. And, you know, most people that I talk to about this election really are either like apathetic or, or not. They're not a diehard one way or another. And, and, you know, there definitely are diehards. And I think the people watching the Republican National Convention are diehard Republicans. And so if Sean O'Brien really wants to give a speech to diehard Republicans, um, you know, I, that, that seems like the kind of speech he was trying to give in terms of, uh, appealing to like the America first and, and trying to tie in the, the union politics to America first. Um, but I think that as a union, we really should be focusing on the majority of Americans, um, who don't vote or don't really, uh, prefer one candidate or the other. Um, even among people who support either Trump or Biden, uh, uh, you know, probably are not enthusiastic supporters one way or another. Um, and so going to the RNC and, you know, him taking this middle of the road approach, uh, to me, it's I feel like it does more damage to associate ourselves as a union with these political parties that Americans already are angry at. And I, I've been involved in a number of organizing campaigns. And one thing I hear a lot is, especially in North Carolina, where a lot of people just have no experience with unions, really don't know much about them. I hear, oh, this is a political thing. It's like, well, no, not quite. <laughs> like they, they see it as, you know, we're involved in, in some sort of government election. And I, you know, I have to explain, like, no, a union is about, you know, you and your coworkers coming together to demand change and demand better on the workplace and demand better as workers, period. Um, and I, I, I just really would like for us as a union to get back to those independent politics. And I, I just think it's disingenuous for Sean O'Brien to say that, that we're taking this middle road bipartisan approach. Like, and instead we're just dipping our hands into both political parties. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm not a fan of Biden. I'm definitely not a fan of Trump. Uh, I think that's true for a lot of people. Uh, but uh, just going back to what Rick said, like it's Republicans that are strangling us. Like uh, North Carolina still has a Jim Crow law on the books that prevents public sector bargaining for public employees. And Republicans have a supermajority in, in the legislature here. And, and not one Republican supports uh, getting rid of that Jim Crow law. And so for me, I, I, I'm, it makes it harder for me to talk to folks and talk about the issues, uh, surrounding like local issues. If we have somebody at the top of our union leadership that is essentially giving a check mark to those Republicans, instead of, you know, talking with them, I, I, you know, I've got no problem talking with Republican coworkers or coworkers that, you know, are more conservative. And I think we should be doing that and, and figuring out how we can have those common issues and how we can like have those conversations where we can talk to these things. Um, because generally I feel like people are receptive to that kind of thing. But when we're talking to a room full of politicians that are cheerleading Donald Trump, that that's all, that's a whole nother Republican <laughs> than like somebody that supports Republicans. But yeah. So um, being a shop floor leader, means standing up against the company, fighting back against contract violations. 
Um, the one good thing about having a contract is that it is in black and white. It says what they can and they cannot do. If you don't have a contract, you don't even have that. Essentially, a company can do whatever they want. Um, if it's not a direct violation of a law, they can do as they please. They can pull stuff out of the air, do one thing one day, another day, something else a different day, just make up the rules as they go. Um, having a contract, having it on paper in black and white, that is an advantage. Does the company follow it? A lot of times they don't, but at least you have that. You have that to refer to, you have that to stand behind, and you can push back against the company. Um, outside of that, having the support of your members, having the support of a fellow steward, having the support of your business agent, your local president. Um, and then even beyond that, like we talked about, the NLRB, the National Labor and Relations Board, you can go to them. You can file charges against the company through them. If your union was to not support you, you can bring charges against your union. We know that Trump wants to disband the NLRB. He wants to put in people that are not going to protect the rights of workers, just like Joe Biden added people that were more pro-union. We have a better NLRB than we had under Trump. And that gives people more confidence to take on those issues on the shop floor, to know that they have law in place behind them and not just empty law, laws that will ultimately be upheld and carried out. We probably won't get those things under Trump. That's going to change the conditions on your shop floor. If people know that there's nobody to back them up, right? How are they going to feel confident enough to stand up to the bosses? How are they going to feel confident enough to stand up for their fellow coworker when they see these wrongdoings happening? That can have huge implications for being able to change your workplace conditions, for, for it to be a safe workplace. Our companies put us in unsafe situations all the time, every single day. We already have to fight that now. Imagine having less protections than we already do. That's regression. We've been regressing for many years. We've been losing a little more, a little more, a little more, a little more. We're not trying to just straddle the road and play both sides. We're trying to actually regain so much of what we lost. And you can't do that by playing footsie with the Democrats and the Republicans. Right. Neither one of them are here to truly serve the interests of the people. And, you know, I understand people who want to vote either way. Right. Everybody's just struggling to survive. People see that it's bad under Biden. You know, a lot of people have the mindset of like, you know, can't really be any worse under Trump. It actually can be worse under Trump. But so many things are so bad that people don't see the harm and like, well, let's try somebody else. And we only have these two options. Right. So like, well, this guy's been awful, so let's try this guy. Um, O'Brien has an opportunity. He has a platform to stand on and really influence the Teamster members, and not just the Teamster members, other union members, other non-union members, other workers. He needs to take that opportunity to educate the members, teach the members how, how exactly Neither the Democrats nor the Republicans are serving the interests of the people. Start growing that idea that we have to form another party. We need a labor party. Is that going to happen overnight? No. But start getting that message, that narrative out. Like somebody mentioned, get in the streets, get in the churches, get in the community, talk to people. The majority of Americans are. Low income and middle income people. Those people are not being engaged with. They're not being educated. They're not being taught. Take them under your wing and help open their eyes and help them see that there is a path forward. Put hope into people's hearts, not just having to choose the lesser of two evils that we've been doing for so long. 
create hope. May not happen tomorrow. Maybe it's hope that we leave for our children, for we leave for the next generation to leave it better than we have found. Because all it's done is gone downhill while most of us have been involved. And, you know, all these, these two parties that we have in place, they're propping up capitalism, the elite. They're propping up the people and the system who exist to exploit and tear down the working class to extract as much value as possible by any means necessary. Everybody's dealing with that. Anybody in the working class can see. No matter what industry you're in, most places are, they have too much work, the amount of people to do it, right? And it's frustrating, day in, day out. And people are sick of that, but neither party is going to help change that. Too many people are influenced by money and power and their own personal opportunity, but that's not what's good for people. That's not what's good for our country. That's not what's going to help change the path that we're on. And as long as we keep choosing the lesser of two evils, we're going to continue down the same road that we've been going on, whether that's a Republican or a Democrat in office. We have to change the whole system to make real progress. And O'Brien has the opportunity to begin those changes and lay that foundation so that we have hope for a better future. Really well said, Jess. It's a side comment that's not really responding to this question so much, but I was talking to a coworker the other day about the debate that had happened, and he was like, man, you know, my dad used to tell me we have to choose the lesser of the two evils, but I look at these two guys and I don't even think one of them is less evil than the other. So I think that's, uh, <laughs> that's where a lot of my people at UPS are at. But to get back to this question at hand, Max, you had asked about the implications of Sean O'Brien's rhetoric at this speech for people at the shop floor level. And I'd like to focus on this one particular quote that really stood out for me in the speech. Um, he was listing a bunch of kind of demands, so to speak, uh, to the Republican Party. And one of them was, we need trade policies that put American workers first. We need to be, it needs to be easier to keep businesses in America. Trade policies that put American workers first, it needs to be easier to keep businesses in America. So what the hell is he actually talking about? Well, he's talking about some major strategic shifts that the ruling class in this country is making right now in their attempts to decrease their economic dependence on the country of China um, in the face of increasing competition, both economically and politically, between the ruling classes of America and China. And to be clear, uh, I don't think that the working people of our country are enemies with the working people of China. I think that we actually are part of one international proletarian class and we need to stand in solidarity with the general masses of China. But it is a fact that the ruling classes between the U.S. and China are increasingly competitive um, to the point of possibly ultimately turning into a third world war. But we're not quite there yet. Nevertheless, um, the capitalists in this country are going to have to make some changes in order to not be so dependent on China anymore. And in order to do that, um, they're going to have to make a number of uh, changes to how they're operating currently, but two changes that are going to especially have an impact on people at the shop floor level is one, they're going to have to impose a lot higher tariffs on things being imported from China. And two, they're going to have to build a lot more uh, industrial production facilities in this country, um, as well as maybe in other countries that aren't China. Um, but there will be some reindustrialization happening in this country in the next couple few decades because of this sh these shifts that they have to make. Um, and on the one hand, uh, this will lead to a larger number of jobs being created in this country, and uh, as uh, trade unionists, as leftists, et cetera, we're not opposed to job creation. But what we are opposed to is that happening entirely on the terms of the ruling class. 
And if given their way, of course, they will always carry these plans out in a way that serves their interests entirely. And I think that one of the things that they see from their perspective is, okay, we're going to have to actually corral like a lot of people, thousands, ten thousands, hundreds of thousands of workers into these new sites of industrial production. And we're going to have to figure out a way to keep them under control. And one way that they will be able to do that is by courting the unions, by trying to establish very cozy relationships with some of the highest level leadership of those unions, and by cutting slimy deals like the ones that um, Tony described between the leadership of the Teamsters with uh, and the um, UPS executives in the last summer's UPS contract. Um, so... In addition to the kind of like uh, need to increase industrial production, um, there's also this factor of needing to establish new and different relationships with the unions. And I think that that's a, a big part of what we're seeing um, with Sean O'Brien speaking at this Republican National Convention. Um, and I kind of disagree with some of the panelists who said, oh, this was just like a one-off thing. We're never going to see it again. Like Sean O'Brien just blew it out of the water and like there's going to be no more chances. I do think that we're going to see this pattern continuing um, throughout time. Uh, and the on the flip side of increasing production, increasing of tariffs and restricting trade from other countries is going to lead to further inflation. Um, and I think to be realistic, Trump is pushing for these things to happen at a faster rate than Biden or the Democrats. And so that is uh, a concrete distinction in the way that he's approaching things. And he's putting forward a clearer strategy for it that, um, he sees as being most advantageous for the ruling class. But to loop this back around to the original Sean O'Brien quote, we need to be clear that these trade policies are not putting American workers first. These trade policies are being crafted and executed uh, in the interests of the ruling class. And they will try to throw us a few crumbs. They will try to use fancy phrases like this to convince us that it's in our interest to just go along with whatever their plan is. But in reality, it's going to be the same as it always has been, which is that we need to fight for every inch of uh, better wages and working conditions, every inch of not being controlled by people in our unions who are in bed with the capitalists and the politicians. Um, and that's never going to come without a struggle. So these are some examples of ways that I see the speech that Sean O'Brien gave relating directly to the lives of working class people in this country in the near and midterm future. Great. Thank you so much, everyone, for such a cool range of conversation here. Um, we're going to kind of bring it back around to just final reflections. So I'll just ask this question, you know, what are your final thoughts on what this means for the election and labor's relation to electoral politics? And I know some of you have already sort of touched on this in past responses, but um, yeah, what are your final thoughts for, for rounding out this incredible panel? I don't want to miss an opportunity to remind everybody that it is the 90th anniversary of the beautiful strike field summer of 1934. And I'm here in Minneapolis as part of that. Um, we don't like adding any words to the end because we can't agree on them. Part of the people making sure that the past is remembered and literally, it's called one of our one of the associated art exhibits is called 1934. And now, how did the labor struggle labor struggles of 1934 relate to what we're dealing with now? And in 1934, the truckers, drivers, and helpers union did not have approval of Teamster leadership to go on strike. They did not have approval. Um, I mean, kind of to do a lot of things. And one of the things that always sticks with me, and I was, I was trying to find it uh, while I was waiting, was one of the initial things that Teamsters just were not interested in were organizing part-timers. 
And I th- a lot of us here are part-timers. And I think that says something about why we are so strong um, on what we're saying and that it, it, another reason why it didn't surprise me that Sean O'Brien was, you know, just kind of willing to throw everybody under the bus is because once again, leadership has decided that the power comes from the top down when it doesn't. And that no matter what happens with Sean O'Brien, I think we should honor his request to go back to driving as soon as possible. Um, No matter what happens in the election, if we still have a semi-functioning country and company shortly after that, we need to take back that power and we need to get people interested in not just filing grievances, but asserting the fact that we make this company run every single day. They're coming up on well, my facility anyways. We're going on to phase two of automation, right? And first thing they want to do is take away our music. You, you can't you can't hear the beep, beep, beep. Uh, that's what I used to call the wrist thing. Um, if you have headphones in that, but, but really it's because they want to control us. They want to make us miserable. They want to have fuck ups that they can blame on people. Um, you know, and that's why they need machines. And that's a whole nother episode for us, Max, if we want to talk about AI implementation and preload. (laughs) Um, but that this is what he's cozying up to, um, is people trying to do away people trying to constantly force workers to be reset. So you're at the lowest wage. So you have to work more um, so that you're more stressed and that you don't have time to organize. Um, I am fortunate that I can make ends meet as a slightly above part-timer, you know, with some few odds and end jobs and sharing cost of living with some other people. But that even that time that I have doesn't feel enough sometimes because we don't, we don't have time on the shop floor. We don't, we are so exhausted and like run wild right now. And for the past several weeks that most of these conversations are happening in the parking lot or over text message. And therefore they're not reaching enough people. It's the people that I've already gravitated towards or that have gravitated towards me that we're having these conversations about how to make our union stronger, about how, um, you know, to deal with all of these changes that are coming up. And that, again, just feel like Sean O'Brien's ready to sell us all out for his own ego. and and that may be a reason that we need to question the way that the hierarchy of the Teamsters is set up because we can't seem to get away from this corrupt <laughs> Teamster boss thing. Like at some point, we got to figure out that concentrating all of the power in one person is not going to lead us to stability and gains in the labor workforce. And I think that was good. So I'm just going to stop right there. Lovely to be here with you all again. Yeah. Thanks for those uh, thoughts, Amber. As Rick brought up, union density in the U.S. has been shrinking for decades. Um, And in the midst of the uh, economic and political shifts that Kat was talking about, the only way that the working class is going to defend itself and expand its power economically and politically is if we call a spade a spade and see behind the rhetoric of uh, a union leader like Sean O'Brien, who talks big talk about, you know, taking on corporate elites while shaking their hands in closed, closed uh, door meetings uh, and leaving teams of workers and the whole working class in the dust. So uh, I think a key task for the working class movement is to expose this betrayal because this. This is not um, this is not working class political independence that we're seeing in this speech. 
this is class collaborationism of a different form than what we've seen in the last uh, couple decades with the previous, uh, you know, loyalty to the Democratic Party. And so this is why the struggle for against class collaboration in our unions is so vital. For all those Teamsters listening to this podcast, I encourage you to come attend uh, our next uh, Teamsters Mobilize meeting. We're going to be talking about the presidential election campaign. Um, go to our website at TeamstersMobilize.com uh, and sign up uh, to come talk about how we can build working class political independence and uh, struggle against these these broad union leaders. Yeah, I think in terms of final reflections, um, well, I think it's been a great conversation tonight, and it's just really important that uh, we do take the time to have these types of conversations, of course, in the election year, um, but also more broadly, um, because I think, you know, I know we're all uh, quite busy on the shop floor and in our locals and, uh, you know, organizing with our coworkers. There's a lot to deal with. Um, on the day to day, uh, a lot of harassment, you know, a lot of just trying to get our coworkers to be engaged and to fight back and to not let a supervisor just beat you down. Um, but it is so important that we do like step back also, uh, to think more broadly, like how, how do we actually address the issues that we're facing, uh, that the working class is facing well in this country, but in every country. Um, and I think you know, what Sean O'Brien was really, uh, one of the things he was saying in his speech, I mean, what Tony said is true. Uh, what Sean O'Brien is doing is class collaborationism. But O'Brien, you know, doesn't even talk about classes in that speech. What he talks about, first of all, he says the workers. And he never says there's actually a working class. Um, but he talks about, like, the corporates and the elites and, like, the big banks and big tech. Uh, and the way he describes them as if is as if there's like some bad capitalists, like those people he's just described, but then also good capitalists who know to like actually work with the workers hand in hand and to advance, you know, the same single interest, uh, whatever it may be. In this case, he's really obviously pushing kind of U.S. Um, nationalism um, and saying that there's the shared interest of getting more jobs back to the U.S. And, uh, you know, we'll work together to do that. But uh, I think uh, it's just really important that we do take a step back. We do see the fact that we, like, as a class, have certain interests that we have to fight for that we, like, in no way can actually advance that fight by just working with and collaborating with and having trust in and, and belief in the capitalists, um, whether or not they're the ones that, you know, are, are running the companies that we work at or that are running these various political parties um, or the, you know, big banks and the media, et cetera. Like we really have to find an independent way forward. And, you know, I, I know different people have, have talked about that, um, today that we do need political independence, that eventually we need to build the formation of a labor party. I think, um, earlier it was Rick maybe talking about, he said like, this is a broken system. It's a bad system. We need a new system. I'd love to live in a new system, but this is what we've got right now. And yeah, we can't be idealistic, uh, and, and say that we're going to be able to build a totally new society tomorrow. But I do think like our, our fight and our discussions within the working class movement today really should be aimed at thinking about how how can we get to the point where we do build enough unity in the working class, where we do build enough clarity and strength, uh, where we can have a you know have a revolution, have a totally new society where actually the working class is in power. Um, and we're told all the time that that's like so impossible. Um, and I think obviously it's in the capitalist class's interest for us to feel like that's impossible, for us to feel like, like my coworker said that I think yesterday, she said, I'd love to have a revolution, but that's never going to work. You know, that's never worked. People are too selfish. People don't want to fight. I try to fight here at UPS and people won't. Um, and I know we, a lot of people do have a lot of kind of experience where you try something and it doesn't work and it can be hard to kind of see the light at the end of the tunnel in a sense. But I think, uh, you know, like Amber was saying to really 
draw from the history from 90 years ago and draw from the history of the entire working class movement in this country and around the world, um, I do have a lot of hope. We're kind of going back at the beginning, Max, you were saying, you know, you're feeling a little, I don't know, mixed up about the overall situation. And yeah, of course, there's a lot of bad things going on in society. There's a lot of darkness, um, but I do feel a lot, a lot of hope. I do feel like, you know, working people want to find the way forward. It's kind of a torturous road, but I, I, I'm confident that we'll find it, we'll walk upon it, um, and we'll be able to uh, live in a new kind of society. Um, yeah, so I would say uh, my final reflections is that, you know, we need to work towards um, teaching people, you know, a lot of people have the mindset that, oh, politics isn't something that I need to worry about. It, it doesn't really apply to me um, because they kind of see politics as just something on Capitol Hill. Um, and and while that, while that is true, um, these are the people that are creating the laws and the policies that affect our everyday lives. Um, everybody has things that they want to see changed and that's politics. Anything that you want to see changed, um, is inherently political because there are forces that don't want to see those things changed. And those people are using resources and policies and their influence to make sure that they don't. And most people are controlled by fear, um, on the shop floor. People are scared to fight back for fear that they will be retaliated against or even fired. Um, so, you know, it, it keeps people in line. Um, and to go even further, people are scared that they'll lose more rights if they really stand up and push back, that, you know, things could get even worse. Um, but they are, little by little. We are losing more and more rights, more and more control, more and more freedoms. Um, so, you know, we have to we have to push past that fear. And the way forward is to not let that fear keep you from doing what you need to do to have your part in making sure that those changes come to fruition. Um, don't be fearful. Be bold. Be assertive. Um, and, you know, by doing that, and letting other people see you do that, it sparks. It, it encourages other people. I can stand up like that too. Um, and anybody can do it. Even if you've never done it before, anybody can have a part in bringing about that change. And maybe that's what you need. Maybe that's what your coworker needs is to see you standing up and to be bold and saying, I can do that too. That person's doing good things. I can do good things. Nobody, nobody is too small. Everybody can have a part and it's going to take everybody. We're all going to have to come together to fight for the common interest and really move this country forward. And it's not going to be through the Republicans or the Democrats. And, um, like I said, Sean O'Brien, he had the opportunity to do that and he has failed. He has failed to do that and he is riding the line and that is not going to push labor forward. Amber, I'm so glad that you brought up the fact that it's the 90th anniversary of the general strike wave of 1934 in this country. And for listeners who aren't familiar with the history, highly encourage go find your favorite labor history book and read about it. Um, but in short, um, during the middle months of the year of 1934, at the bottom of the Great Depression, at a time when there was no unemployment insurance, there was no social security, there was um, no real uh, well-established legal rights to unionize millions of workers in this country, the lowest paid, least skilled workers, who all of the union leaders had said can't be organized, shouldn't be organized, we shouldn't even try to organize these people into unions, rose up, went on strikes that spanned across um, across many different workplaces, across entire industries, and ultimately uh, won a lot of concessions from the ruling class that are not to be taken for granted that we still... Um, you know, can leverage today to our advantage. 
And I think uh, I see this has these historical facts as evidence and proof that the people will rise up when the time comes. The people will be ready to fight when the time comes. And the question is, for those of us who see a longer trajectory for the labor movement beyond winning a few concessions, what is our plan? Of course, we're not we're not at that point right now where millions of workers in this country are spontaneously rising up and going on strike. We all know that. We've all experienced frustrations and feelings like our coworkers are apathetic. But if we ourselves see a basis to be able to provide leadership when that time comes in the midst of a period of crisis, I think that what we need to do now is really find others who see things in the same way, get together and study history, study theory, make a plan, try to consolidate ourselves ideologically, try to, of course, um, get involved in our unions if, if there is one, learn about the landscape, learn about the contradictions amongst the people, um, and acquire lots of practical knowledge as well. Um, but we shouldn't kid ourselves into thinking that we can just build the fire as one or two or five or 10 people. The fire is going to spark off at some point. And what we need to do is prepare ourselves, strengthen ourselves as leaders, um, whether that's uh, on the shop floor or at a national scale, um, and instill in ourselves confidence uh, in the in the people themselves. And for those who are feeling angry, perturbed, confused, upset, don't even know how you feel about Sean O'Brien speaking at the Republican National Convention, I hope that at least these more general and broader reaching thoughts can um, maybe make you sit down and think a little bit. Uh, because ultimately, everything that seems unusual or confusing or unprecedented in our society, we can figure out ways to understand it. We can figure out ways to fight against it. We have to get organized. We have to educate ourselves. Um, and we have to stand in solidarity with those that will fight alongside us one day. Over and out. Ultimately, no one's going to remember what Sean O'Brien said. They're going to remember that he was there. Uh, and that's my problem with the, pl with the platform in which he chose to give this speech. Uh, I thought the speech, any in, in most other venues, two thirds of it was great. Um, the fact that you went to that 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 event, knowing that ultimately it's about getting Donald Trump elected, means that you knew what you were getting into. Uh, we can argue whether it was it was the right thing, wrong thing. If you were talking to the larger audience in the TV audience, and will they remember uh, that union that union speech? Uh, that's yet to find out. Ultimately, it's my view, and um, it's my view that that Trump knew what he wanted, and he got a, a major union to come in and, and say nice things about him, and that is what is going to be used from now to the election time. Everything else, I don't have any personal attacks against anybody. I just think strategically it was a bad move, and I think strategically it's going to be something that is going to end up uh, hurting Biden or whomever the Democrats put forth, but ultimately hurting the members and hurting the union. Because if Trump gets elected, they've already told us what they've done, they've, they wanna do. It's written down in Project 2025. Mm -hmm. And they have a whole labor section about how they wanna do it with prevailing wage and uh, screw up the, the NLRA. Uh, there's so much uh, that can happen. And maybe, maybe we need it. Maybe we need bad things to happen to get us to come back together. I don't know, but I do know if Trump is reelected, uh, it, it's it's going to be a, it's going to be a dark four years. Uh, thank you so much. One thing that really stuck with me the most isn't the speech itself. It, it was Sean O'Brien doubling down the next day, uh, reposting the Holly article, um, and and reposting. I mean the transphobic uh, text of that article, uh, and praising Holly as the one you know good conservative pro labor conservative while throwing you know trans teamsters like myself under the bus um it, it's just really disappointing to see um 
I, I'm not necessarily surprised. You know, I, unfortunately, just for Sean O'Brien's own political calculus on uh, when he runs runs again, you know, he probably cares more about Republican Teamsters than he does about trans Teamsters. And, and that's just like unfortunate reality of it. Um, I, I think ultimately, I agree a lot with what Rick says is that folks are just going to remember that he was there. And, you know, it, it it's just going to hurt the Teamsters more than anything else. It's going to hurt the members of the Teamsters. It's going to hurt, you know, if Trump is elected, it's going to hurt organizing campaigns that are ongoing. Um, I, I think we have seen that some staffers within the IBT are upset. Um, one had posted that rogue post on social media. Um, the, because they have to deal a lot with um, like these in the organizing campaigns with the laws in various states and in Republican run states, labor laws are way worse. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, you know, thanks for having me on. And uh, I think it's an important thing to talk about, especially like between Teamsters and how we can move forward because I, we want to build a stronger union and we need to hold our leadership accountable to do that. Yeah, I've never been more disenchanted about a national election as this one because, you know, the two choices we were given are not ideal by any by any means. Um, you know, in a perfect world, we'd have a labor party, right? Um, you know, made up of working people that actually could you know, express what the working people in the United States need. Um, hot, weird take on this one, but Sean O'Brien did walk into the Republican convention and do a fiery labor speech. What if this is setting up the groundwork for a labor party? This is what people are understanding is my conservative friends, my working class people, that I'm friends with and and talk to all said they loved Sean O'Brien's speech. A lot of those people aren't really hip to the politics. They don't they don't care, but they've heard the speech and they go, you know what, that dude spoke to me. I know it's not under ideal circumstances. I get it. Um, but touching on some of the stuff that people said, bringing up the 1934 Minneapolis strike. Um, you know, the last really labor friendly president we had was Franklin Roosevelt, you know, did wonders for working people. Um, we haven't had the power to shut down the country. You know, if we were talking about the rail strike or whatever, just just recently, it. Um, it's not <laughs> coming out of the pandemic and everything, I, I understand why the uh, Negotiations were postponed and, you know, there was compromises made because as we were healing as a nation coming out of the pandemic, a rail strike wasn't a great time. And I'm going to tell you, if it did happen, uh, the view on labor would not be so hot with the average ordinary American person. Um, yeah, I sure I would have thought it was great. But um, yeah, most people would be like, after we just went through all of this, you guys are going to shut down the country. Um I think the timing was bad. Um, 1970, Wildcat strike. A lot of you are probably familiar with that. Well, my grandfather was actually a part of that and shut the shit down. It, it was pretty hot. Um, but we haven't had a strong labor leader that's been able to rally, you know, 3 million Teamsters or however many we were uh, members at the time. Um, I hear, I hear a lot of people commenting. It sounds like they're, you know, unhappy with the UPS contract or, you know, it, the contract before that one was a lot worse. I know that had two tiered system, the 22, 22 fours, um, that guy, I mean, 350,000 teamsters under a U, uh, UPS contract, you're not going to make everybody happy. I get it. But the thing we're missing is 70% of the fucking membership voted for it. So, you know, squeaky wheel, I get it, but this is democracy. This is the compromise and people were okay with it. They signed off with it. Don't blame it on other people. You know, it's, you know, 70% is not a, a it's, it wasn't close, you know, 
Um, with the election, like I said, I'm I'm looking at both choices. Going, God help, God help us. Um, I think it's uh, like these are the two best people we have in the United States. I mean, uh, pretty much a lot of us would agree. If we can get rid of them both and just start fresh and draw two names out of the hat, I think most, a lot of people would go for that. Um, to you know, to say you know the Democrats have been historically labor friendly, but you know, when I make the, the, what I tell my friends is there's one party that says they're for organized labor and there's one party that's vehemently against organized labor. But the thing is, is what actually are they doing for labor? It's we're in a kind of, as working people in a shitty position and, you know, I would love to see a third party that would that would kind of balance the scales but this is the you know the shit hand we're dealt with in you know the united states right now and you know i i'll tell you right now sean o'brien himself could have me in a headlock telling me you have two choices vote for donald trump or satan and i'd be voting for the morning star if you get what i mean but the thing is is look at the other choice i'm like you know Yes, he might be the most pro-labor president. He has his flaws. I get it. Like I said, I'm disenchanted. But the thing is, is, you know, bashing Sean O'Brien for going in there into the lion's den and, you know, shitting all over the white rug and smearing his feet and, you know, uh, putting his muddy cowboy boots on the couch, if you know what I mean. Um, people don't see it because they're they're either blinded by their hatred for the Republicans, blinded by their hatred for Sean O'Brien blinded for their hatred from Trump. But the thing is, is something unprecedented happened a few days ago that I'm, you know, sure, you know, I'm not a big Sean O'Brien fanboy, but I do give credit where credit is due. Because if you put the first one third of the speech aside and listen to the second two thirds, that's what everybody wants to hear. And the thing is, it was just in a, in a very strange, unsuspecting venue. But if I was a big corporation and throwing a pizza party for my employees and telling them how unions are no good, that's a captive audience. What did Sean O'Brien just do? He held a captive audience at the Republican fucking convention. Well, love it or hate it, it is what it is. Now it's time for the Democrats to tell him to get in there, do that again, but do it even better. And if that doesn't happen, I don't know what to tell you. So anyways, um, it's been fun, guys. Um, it's been a great time. You know, I have knots in my stomach for what's coming in November because, you know, God help us all. And thank you very much. All right, gang, that's going to wrap things up for us this week. I want to thank all of our amazing Teamster guests calling in from across the country for taking time out of their busy schedules to be on this panel and share their vital thoughts and perspectives. I really, really appreciate you guys. And I want to thank the great Mel Buer for co-hosting with me. And like we said in the episode, Mel and I want to and are planning to do more of these kinds of panels through the election season and beyond. We want to keep talking to more folks, union and non-union, and getting more perspectives. And we want you guys to reach out to us. Let us know what you thought of this panel and send us your suggestions for folks you want us to talk to in future panels and topics that you want us to address. And as always, I want to thank you guys for listening, and I want to thank you all for caring. We'll see you all back here next week for another episode of Working People. And if you can't wait that long, then go subscribe to our Patreon and check out the awesome bonus episodes that we've got there for our patrons. And of course, go explore all the great work that we're doing at the Real News Network, where we do grassroots journalism that lifts up the voices and stories from the front lines of struggle. Sign up for the Real News newsletter so you never miss a story and help us do more work like this by going to therealnews.com forward slash donate and becoming a supporter today. I promise you it really makes a difference. I'm Maximilian Alvarez. Take care of yourselves. Take care of each other. Solidarity forever. 
When my face you no longer see, I live on, yes, I live on. Wherever we go, we are going to roll the union on the song. I live on, yes, I live on. Wherever hungry, hungry are we. Just as hungry as hungry can be. Yes, son, I live on. Yes, I live on. Well, mean things are happening in this land. It's read a song. I live on. Yes, I live on. Wherever the book mean things are happening in this land is read. I live on. Yes, I live on. Thank you so much for watching The Real News Network, where we lift up the voices, stories, and struggles that you care about most. And we need your help to keep doing this work. So please, tap your screen now, subscribe, and donate to The Real News Network. Solidarity forever.